Yeah, man. You just saw a title that says review of an Epiphone Les Paul standard 1960s model. And you saw a thumbnail that showed a picture of this guitar and said review of an Epiphone Les Paul. And you smashed that thumbnail so hard, I heard you click all the way here. Uh, but guess what? That was just clickbait. This video is actually about some weight loss supplements that I'm selling. Nah, just kidding. Now, uh, so why don't we review this guitar right now? There's an old Chinese proverb that says, only a Gibson is good enough. <laughs> yeah, come on, let's face it. Things have changed a little bit since ancient China. And in modern day China, they make these. This is an Epiphone Les Paul electric guitar. Uh-huh. So why don't you stick around because uh, you are now watching Guitar Quackery and we're about to do a very detailed review of this bad boy. I'm going to tell you right away that this is uh, in fact a high quality guitar for uh, the price of six hundred and ninety nine dollars it's a good deal um, it's an Epiphone Les Paul standard 1960s how can you tell the difference between the 1960s and the 1950s the 1960s has these tuning machines they look like Grovers but they are not Grovers they are Wilkinson it's a budget brand, okay? It is a budget guitar for $6.99. For this quality, it's a budget guitar. So first, we want to look at the nut. Uh, this is a dial indicator that I use in all of my videos. Uh, it is to measure how much the string moves before it hits the fret. But before we use it, we need to establish, because we're going to be using the second fret as reference, we need to establish that we have uh, an even fretboard in this area, yeah, in first position. So now we place it uh, on the high E string, and then we are going to push the string against the second fret. So this is how much the string moves before it hits the second fret. But then there's a gap that's left over. And this gap is uh, a, a little bit too high on this string. The B string, now we're going to measure that relief. And that's also way too high. Um, it should really move only two uh, check marks, which is two one hundredths of a millimeter. Uh, that's kind of like the maximum that I would like it to be. Here we have the G string. Yeah, way too high. And then uh, the D. Not quite as high as the G, but still too high. A string. And the low E. Okay, way too high, obviously. So, why is that? Well, on uh, budget guitars, uh, one would assume that um, they just glue in a ready-made nut and call it good without doing any filing of the string slots, which is not only labor-intensive, but um, it is a high-skilled job and high-skilled workers cost money. So. I would assume they just install the nut and call it good. But let's not assume. This is why we have a microscope. I have not touched uh, this guitar in any way since I bought it. Um, and this is how it comes from the factory. So let's look at the string slots through the microscope. So first thing we want to look at is if the strings are nice and tight at the front end there shouldn't be any play at the front end there should be a little play at the back end so this seems to be the case on the high E string now let's check the B um, 
it seems to be okay. The G string, yep. D. So if the string moves inside of the string slot at the front end, you might get sitar uh, sounding buzz. Here it's nice and tight. We have a little play at the back end. And now we have the same situation here. Okay, so this seems to be okay. Uh, next, we want to check, um, we want to remove the strings from the string slots and uh, see if the string slots have been filed or if it's just an untouched uh, pre-made nut. So let's have a look at that. So let me uh, remove this string and let's have a look. Let's zoom in a little bit. So, interestingly, I do see uh, some toe marks from a uh, nut file at the bottom of the string slot. Interestingly, um, surprisingly, the string slot on the uh, low E string was filed at the factory. I did not expect to see that. This is a total surprise for me. So now let's uh, move over to the A string and let's remove the string and look. And here, as you can see, we have a different situation. This is um, an injection molded piece of plastic. And there are no tool marks at the bottom of the string slot. So this string slot uh, was not filed at the factory. I'm going to put the string back on. And then we are going to examine the D string next. So let me move the guitar in this direction and remove the D string. Okay, let's have a look. We can see it right here. Let's zoom in a little more. And we see the same exact situation as we saw on the A string. Uh, we can also see that um, the string is um, pushing at, at the string slot, uh, at the side of the string slot at the back end. Okay, so this is not desirable. We want to have all the pressure here and uh, no pressure at the back end. Well, uh, this is because the string slot goes straight, but the string has an additional brake angle going towards the tuning machine. Let's put the D string back and move on to the next string, which is uh, the G string. Okay. Here we see it. Okay. Let's uh, see what's at the bottom of the string slot. We'll be able to see if we zoom in. Now, interestingly, I believe that this string slot was hand filed. So this is quite a surprise. I really was not expecting to see any tool marks from, uh, from, uh, from not files on any of the string slots. Let's move over to the B string up okay I have a feeling it's been filed and yes it was filed okay so 
Uh, how many? Five string slots we've examined so far. Three of the string slots were hand filed. And now we're going to look at the uh, high E string. It looks like this string was a little damaged. Uh, no big deal. So let's remove the string. I have a feeling that we are going to discover that this string was a uh, string slot was also filed. And yes, there you have it. So this is uh, very surprising to me. Let's put the string back. Um, I really was not expecting um, to see that. Uh, so, the guitar has a small sticker at the back of the headstock that says handcrafted in China. And I think we need to give them credit. Uh, if they were hand filing these nut slots, there is some handcrafting uh, that takes place at the factory on these guitars. Yeah. Next, we want to examine the frets. Now, um, I'm going to strip the guitar later, uh, which will give me full access to the fretboard. And at that time, I will uh, check if all the frets are even. Right now, we want to look at the frets through the microscope. This is the first fret. Uh, we can zoom in a little bit at the fret end. And this tells us uh, a lot, actually. So we see tool marks uh, going sideways, which means um, they used um, a file at the side of the fretboard uh, to file down the fret ends. Here we can see that um, the poly finish spills onto the binding here a little bit like this and tapes off, tapers off in this direction. And we can see the exact same situation on the other side. We see uh, some steel wool here. Look at that. So I uh, would suspect that they use steel wool at the factory at some point to polish the frets. Okay. Now, uh, let's go back to, let's discuss this thing. So, we see that it flares off like that. I have a theory about that. Let me take a piece of tape. So, um, I'm going to show you through the microscope if we take a piece of tape, so let me just first remove the string. Okay, so if we take a piece of tape and we place it like this, there's a little opening here on the side. You see that? So uh, I would imagine that they tape off the fretboard and then spray the uh, lacquer, the poly finish, and some of it simply sprays into this little pocket onto on both sides, right? Which is why we see uh, this area like this. So uh, let's put the string back, and now let's look at the rest of the fret. So um, the fret is uh, polished quite well. I do have to admit, uh, there are some um, up and down scratches, which, uh, sorry about the shakiness, let me focus, okay. So um, the up and down scratches going in this direction would indicate that at some point they run a little bit of sandpaper or maybe steel wool in this direction. I don't know. Uh, now the guitar was played a little bit, so there's already a little bit of uh, fret wear 
microscopic, obviously. And let's look at the rest of the fret. So, uh, if we compare the two sides, uh, well, this is very interesting. So, let's zoom in on this fret end here. We can see tool marks on the two sides of the fret end, which means they filed, they hand filed the fret ends on this side. Now, um, what we don't see is any sprayed finish here or here, okay, like we see on the other side. Uh, but we do see some tool marks going in this direction from the file. Uh, so let's go back to the other fret end. Here, as you can see, they did not file the two little corners, which is the reason why we still have this finish here on this side. Uh, so if we look at the second fret, uh, it's the same. And then on this side, it's the same as on the first fret on the base side. Right? We can see that the fret end uh, had been filed by hand. So what does this mean? Uh, well, I guess whoever was uh, assigned to this job um, forgot to work on the treble side. But the frets are not sharp. I don't really have any issues with that. Um, now I just want to go down the entire fretboard uh, and look at all the fret ends first on the bass side and then on the treble side. So let's do that. We're still looking at the second fret and now we go over to the third fret, fourth, fifth fret. This one looks pretty good. Let's zoom in on this fret. So once again, um, I think it's clear uh, that um, there are some tool marks uh, going in this direction from, from the file. A file is, um, well, they, they could have used a number of files but um, something like this was maybe used and then the bottom edge simply scratched the surface of the binding. Okay, let's move on to, what is this now, the sixth fret, seventh. Well, this one looks a little sloppier. Um, yeah. Now this is very interesting. We see a little bit of um, uh, finish over spray here from, uh, uh, you know, from, well, finishing the fretboard. And we also see a scratch mark right there, which means well, I guess uh, whoever was doing the fret and uh, dressing procedure just nicked the fret here, but uh, failed to, to take this off. Uh, but they did uh, hit um, the corner on the other side of this fret. We're going to move on. Okay, so no major surprises. Um, it's kind of consistent. It is not um, the best fret and dressing. But then again, we don't see um, the best work on more expensive guitars either, always. Sometimes we do. So now, let's move the guitar 
sideways and look at the, the treble side. So here, uh, we're zoomed in on, on the 15th fret. It seems like a little bit of a fret and dressing did take place here. Yeah, you can see a, a tool mark there. All right. And now we're going to move up the fretboard or down, however you want to say it. Okay, so I can see a tool mark right here on this one. Uh, not so much, okay. Here we can see that um, there's still some spillage on the side of the fret right here, right? And now we move over to this fret. Okay, so this, uh, we do have a, quite a chunk here of finish uh, that we can actually remove, why not? I'm going to get a small chisel. So here's the small chisel. And let me just remove this piece here. Okay. So I'm just uh, doing a, a rough cleanup job. I'm not going to get into uh, any uh, f finer details right now. I'm doing this just to show you how much uh, finish spilled over from uh, uh, the spraying of the neck. Yeah. All right. So this is the chisel I was using. Let's put it away and let's move over to the next fret. Okay, more of the same. No fret and dressing there. Well, uh, they did dress the fret ends uh, in this direction. They just uh, did not use uh, the fret and dressing file to uh, kiss the corners on the two sides of the frets. But like I said, they're not sharp. Um, it's all good. All right. I just want to show you all of the frets one by one. Okay. So it does appear that um, whoever was assigned this job, missed a few frets, and did it uh, maybe a little bit in a hurry. Okay, no big deal. We can still play the guitar. I do want to look at, um, not really look at the setup, because a setup is adjustable. But I do want to look at um, the truss rod, which is what we need to adjust when we do a setup. And I basically want to make sure that the truss rod works uh, as expected. It is a two-way truss rod. It uses a four millimeter Allen key, okay? And a two-way truss rod can be tightened in both directions. So if the neck has an up bow, which is what a neck should have when the strings are tuned to full tension, then we tighten the truss rod 
clockwise um, to work to make it work against that string tension right and we would leave a little bit of relief in my opinion a neck should never be completely straight it should have a little bit of relief so the problem is that uh, some necks nowadays have um, a built-in back bow and even after you put the strings on the guitar they still have a back bow so the manufacturers will tell you it's not a problem because the guitar has a two-way truss rod so you can just crank it in the opposite direction counterclockwise but let's think about that uh, now the truss rod is um, helping the strings put the neck into a little bit of an up bow to put a relief on the neck and um, if you have to do that that's never going to be a good neck all right so i have to tell you something i already checked this guitar before i bought it so i know that this neck is good but um, i just want to show you what it is that you should look for and i also want to tell you that uh, i looked at um, a few guitars and I chose this one because um, some of the other guitars had the issue that I was just describing which is not uncommon okay so uh, here we have some feeler gauges if all the frets are even I like to put six one thousandths of a relief uh, measured on the eighth fret okay and if you've seen my videos uh, in the past you know that I measure a relief on both sides I put the neck block close to the heel and neck rest close to the heel and I measure it here so this is six one thousandths next one is eight one thousandths does not pass so I know my relief is uh, this much um, on the treble side we want it to be the same or maybe sometimes less six one thousandths is passing okay next one eight one thousandths is not okay so now we know that we can adjust the relief equally on both sides now we want to know if the truss rod is uh, tight in this direction and it is you see so now I'm, I'm, I'm tightening it I'm putting more force which means if I go in this direction it should it should be coming be it should be becoming looser okay which is exactly what it what is happening okay and now it's completely loose as you can see so now when it's completely loose we are going to see more relief and this time i'll just show you on on the base side so let's start with eight one thousandths okay passes 11 no okay so uh it's loose now we need to tighten it just a little bit to get the right amount of relief okay so it functions as intended now it's six eight does not pass okay just uh, showing you one more time okay okay so it's a little bit tight this concludes um, this part of the review well I can maybe show you a close-up of uh, the tuning machines since the cameras right here these are Wilkinson tuners I would say inspired by Grover uh, to the untrained eye they look the same but uh, Grover's would have a smaller uh, circle here 
uh, they're a little bit different. And obviously it says Wilkinson on the back here, not Grover. Uh, here it says handcrafted in China. Okay. Uh, the guitar has a scarf joint on, on the headstock here. So that's another uh, thing that is uh, typical for uh, an Epiphone. Nothing wrong with uh, this kind of scarf joint. I have issues with scarf joints that are here. Okay. Uh, but here is fine. Um, you can see uh, the logo, everything. And, you know, might as well show you the serial number. Uh, what is it? Uh, 220, <clears throat> no, 2210152 Okay, you, you see that. Yeah, that's the serial number of this guitar. And it's uh, veneer on top. Okay, let's put it back here. I'm gonna take the strings off. I'm gonna take, um, we're gonna look at the control cavity and that's gonna be the second part of this review. I know what you're thinking. Man, what a fantastic review. How can I make sure that YouTube recommends these kinds of reviews to me in the future? Well, it's easy. Just tell YouTube what you like by clicking the like button. You're probably also thinking, uh, well, since no other channel makes these kind of review videos, how can I make sure that this channel doesn't go bankrupt? It's easy. You can support this channel. You can make sure that you don't click skip ad when the ads are playing, because then I don't get any money. And you can buy some Guitar Quackery merch below. Uh, uh, there's also a link to the Patreon account, etc. Just check out the links below. And then you must be thinking, well, this guy must be working like 12 hour days. How can I make sure that he doesn't fall asleep while editing these videos for me to watch? That's easy too. Just click the link that says, buy me a coffee. Thank you. The guitar has been stripped. Uh, we're going to look at the fretboard first. Uh, we're going to start with this little tool. If you're not familiar with it, it's called a fret rocker. We put it across three frets. If the middle one is higher, we hear click, click, click rocking. So uh, I already look at the fretboard. It's mostly good. There are three frets that are slightly higher than the others, uh, no big deal, the guitar is playable. So let's have a look at that. So we place it here, no rocking, no rocking here, we hear a little bit, okay, nothing, nothing. All right, nothing here and here. So the 12th fret is higher on this side, on the base side. All right, but I only detect uh, uh, the uh, height discrepancy on the base side. Nothing here. So 14th fret is higher here. 15th fret, 16. Okay. Okay, it's all good. The rest of the fretboard is good. Now, uh, we want to take a, a feeler gauge and check if the frets have been seated all the way. Uh, and yes, even this one that's slightly higher seems to be seated all the way. Well, maybe not quite. There you go. So uh, that explains it. I'm detecting a little gap here. 
a little gap here. So they're mostly good, small gap. That's the 12th fret, which is higher on this side, and that's a significant gap. So that explains why it's higher. A uh, little gap here. So it doesn't seem like the frets have been glued in. Little gap. Uh, but they are mostly well seated. Now, um, the frets have not gone through a leveling procedure. And we can, uh, we can tell by uh, examining the frets through the microscope. So let's have a look. We're looking at the crown of the fret, okay? And um, how can I tell that the fret uh, was never leveled? Well, when you level frets, um, it would produce a flat area on top first, and then it would have to be recrowned, uh, basically hand filed or plaqued on the plaque machine. Um, in order to recrown the fret, which means make it round again. Um, I have no, uh, I, I see no evidence that any crowning was done. And I see no evidence that uh, there are any flat spots. And that would tend to uh, suggest that no leveling was done on this fretboard. So the frets were installed and that's it. Here we can see the pickups. So we're going to remove those pickups and look at the um, pickups from the back. And we're also going to look at the pickup cavities. This is an Epiphone pickup, obviously. Um, and here is also an Epiphone pickup. Now, uh, what we're going to look at is this cavity. Uh, on a Gibson, you would see a tenon joint, like a, either a short tenon or a long tenon. And here, we don't see that. So the neck does not extend into the pickup cavity. And that's how Epiphones are built, I guess. The bridge is an Epiphone bridge, which is slightly different from a Gibson bridge. Um, these holes are bigger diameter, and these posts are different than what we see on a Gibson. So we have uh, threaded bushings and threaded posts. That's a large diameter. Uh, post uh, thread it's in fact the same diameter that we see on these so uh, the bushings used here or here are the same ones you can see I can I can uh, put this here to show you right clearly it fits um, they're not very tight okay so uh, yeah, that's how guitars are made, even Gibson guitars. Now, I want to put uh, a few screws back, at least loosely, so that we can turn the guitar around. This, by the way, is a veneer. Uh, this is not a... Well, it is a solid maple cap, but um, the top that you're seeing is just a, a maple veneer okay so not like on a gibson now we want to turn the guitar around and look at the electronics uh, here you can see the switch this is not a switch craft switch like you would see on a gibson this is a, a shorter switch um, it works but it's not a high quality switch like on a gibson and here we see, well, you know, this is a Epiphone, I would call it spaghetti wiring. Too, too many long wires and 
uh, I guess because uh, some of the workers at the factory are not uh, skilled workers. They use these connectors so that people at the factory can assemble this. All right. Uh, the surface here is also veneer. Okay, it's a piece of veneer. How can you tell? Well, you can just look at uh, um, the here, the side of the guitar. And if you look closely, I can't show you now, but you, you would see that this is made out of a few segments. And um, obviously, when you look from the back, you, you don't see any segments. Just like um, the heel of the neck here, it is um, two pieces, right? So there's uh, one piece of wood here. You can see the glue joint. And then the neck is also a separate piece of wood. And that maybe explains why we don't see a tenon joint here. It's some different kind of joint. Okay, so now we just want to um, look at the side of this nut through the microscope. I'll use this microscope so we can uh, uh, look from uh, different angles. Here you can see that uh, the nut um, is seated after the guitar is finished, sprayed, right? Uh, that's very obvious. Uh, there are some gaps, but once again, this is a cheaper guitar. We can see a few gaps right there. And if we look at the treble side, we can see that there's a little bit of a gap there. Some overlapping material. And that's about it. We obviously see some imperfections. Not a big deal. It is a budget Les Paul. The real Les Paul, the Gibson Les Paul, is uh, a lot more money. Um, and I don't really know what else to tell you about this guitar. Okay, I got nothing else to show you. Oh, excuse me. Guitar quackery. Dude, that's a good idea, but I'm a really lousy guitar player. <laughs> okay, if you insist. All right, thanks, bye. Ah. This viewer wants to see me play the guitar. Yeah, but I'm warning you. Okay, just what we need. Another guy playing a Les Paul on YouTube. <laughs> surprises it plays well what you expect this is not the last time you're gonna see this guitar on this channel I'm gonna keep this guitar for a while um, and we are going to uh, use it in other videos we're going to use this guitar to compare it to a Gibson and we are also going to Gibsonize this guitar. Uh, so that's something that has been done, you know, but uh, not the way I'm gonna do it. So, yeah, just make sure you're subscribed to this channel because that's really not something you're gonna want to miss. And uh, yeah, uh, so downstairs, remember you can buy some Guitar Quackery merch, you can buy me a coffee. Uh, there's a link that says buy me a coffee. Thank you. And what else can you do? Well, if you haven't clicked like, share and subscribe by now, come on. I'll see you soon.